All right. Hello, everyone. Just take one more minute and then we'll get kicked right off to it. Okay, so hello and welcome to the Watertown Glacier Science and History Week 2022. My name is Samara Hawkins. I'm an internet content and new media officer for Parks Canada here at Waterton Lakes National Park. Thank you so much for joining us. It's the fourth and final day of our webinar series. This series aims to highlight research and conservation topics related to the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. These topics are selected from dozens of projects conducted in the heart of the crown of the continent. We want to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional and ancestral homes, homelands of the Siksike, Sitapi, Kootenai, Salish, and Kolispe people who recognize, who we recognize as the original stewards of this land and all of the relatives within it. With gratitude, we honor the people who have cared for this land throughout the generations and continue to maintain enduring connections to their traditional territories. Today, Dr. Peter Dawson and Edwin Knox are presenting the topic, Digitally Preserving Culturally Modified Trees in Waterton Lakes National Park. Dr. Peter Dawson is the Department Head of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Calgary. He is an archaeologist specializing in the digital preservation of heritage sites at risk due to the impacts of climate change and human-caused destruction. He has conducted archaeological research in the Canadian Arctic and Western North America for over 30 years. He's the, also the director of two online digital heritage archives, the Alberta Digital Heritage Archive and the Kikik Taraktuk uh, Herschel Island Digital Heritage Archive. Uh, Edward Knox is a recently, has recently retired after a 36 year career with Parks Canada at Waterton Lakes National Park. He's worked numerous functions, including trail crew, park warden, visitor safety, vegetation management, and finally, as the cultural resource management program lead. Edwin continues to contribute to the cultural resource management function through the park's volunteer program. Okay, on to some housekeeping items. The presentation is going to last around 35 minutes and there'll be five to 10 minutes at the end for questions. If you want to ask a question, uh, click the chat icon, up, icon at the top of your screen to type your questions at any time. Be mindful that your questions and comments will be visible to all participants. You're also welcome to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will address as many questions as we can before 1 p.m. Uh, to improve your viewing experience, uh, click the triple dot more icon at the top of your screen to select full screen and then click focus on content. For live captioning, to select uh, select turn on live captioning, which is also in the more drop down menu. OK, now we will turn over the time to Edwin Knox, our first presenter today. Now, do you see me sharing? Yes, we do. All right, from the beginning, slideshow. Thank you very much for the introduction. And is that my first slide there nice and clear now? You got it. Full screen, great. So thank you very much. Pleasure to co-present about this interesting uh, historical site in Waterton with Dr. Peter Dawson. And I'll scroll to the second slide. You see the second slide there clearly? Yes, we do. Peter pictured on the right is amidst the scribed aspens at the Kootenai Brown homestead cabin site. You see the initials and the dates and some of the trees just in this image here. Uh, and uh, we'll call them culturally modified trees. The first thing that caught my eye when searching for this cabin site in 2016 were prayer flags just east of the Maskinon. A reminder for me as I headed in there that evening that indeed this is the ancestral lands of the people of the Blackfoot Confederacy, as was so nicely acknowledged in the intro, the lands of the Kainai, the Pikani, the Siksika. Our subject for today's talk, that land amidst the rich and long enduring history of the Indigenous people. The habitation, hunting and gathering, ceremonial sites, cultural sites of all description. Pictured here, the view southeast from Lakeview Ridge, Minnestaco, Chief Mountain, 
sacred site of the Blackfoot. And seeing the Waterton area first in 1865, Kootenai Brown knew the people of the Plains well. John George Kootenai Brown eventually became Waterton's first park official. He'd been a promoter early on for it being set aside as a park and later for its expansion. In 1895, the area was set aside as a forest reserve. In 1901, he was appointed fishery officer and in 1910 became the forest ranger in charge for the newly created Dominion Park. Much is communicated about him in books, movies, articles galore, and websites. <clears throat> Try a Google search, 23,400 results the last time I looked. And this photo of Kootenai taken from the Glenbow collection. The photo was taken of Kootenai in Cardston in 1901. His living descendants from his son Leo continue to visit Waterton. Pictured here from the entrance parkway, the Brown family gravesite. Great great grandchildren will now see a handsome new picket fence. Within plaques are scribed. Olivia Leone Brown, 1849-1884. And Isabella Brown, 1856, 1935. The Irish cross stone marker reads George Brown, born 1839, died 1916, gone but not forgotten. With Science and History Day being a Waterton Glacier collaboration, I'd like to note that it is indeed known in the recorded history that Kootenai's park management sentiments were shared with his colleagues to the south. The wildlife and waters know no man-made borders. Like park managers a century later, still working collaboratively across the 49th for the ecosystem's greater good in wildlife management, wildfire, and two in work such as public safety and visitor education. Here, pictured with his good friend and colleague, Glacier Park Ranger, Albert Reynolds. In his 40 years in the valley, Kootenai is associated with five different cabin locations. Poplar Grove you see being bottom left in the corner. The time frame associated with the first three are plus or minus a year in a couple of cases. And this is a good place too for me to recognize Waterton history researchers who've amassed much of what is understood today about Kootenai Brown and Waterton history generally. Early on, William McDougall Tate and William Rodney. More recently, Graham McDonald and Rob Watt, others, and our dedicated Parks Canada archaeologists, Bill Perry and his team. A brief mention now of the other cabin sites. One of the first water and photos, this 1881 shot by George Mercer Dawson, shows the canoe's trading post. The building is just visible above my indicator built on the east shore of Knights Lake, framed by Sheep Mountain, now Vimy. Dawson was here with the International Boundary Survey in 1874, and again in the Rockies between 81 and 83 with the Geological Survey of Canada. His diary entries for late July 1881 meeting Hunter Brown are most interesting. Kootenai partnered for a time with Fred Canoose trading at this cabin with Indigenous peoples from both sides of the Continental Divide. And just across the river, another cabin associated with the Canoose Kootenai Brown Partnership, located in the meadow near today's park entrance kiosks. This photo was taken in 1884. Alexander Stavely Hill and Kootenai are seated in the foreground. Kootenai there in the middle. Hill was a member of the British House of Commons, and he founded the vast Oxley Ranch in the districts of present day Champion and Staveley, north of Fort Macleod. While in the region and not busy at the ranch, he traveled west into the mountains. He published an account of these adventures in a book called From Home to Home, 
autumn wanderings in the Northwest in the years 1881 to 1884. In one chapter of the book, he wrote an interesting account about his travels in the Waterton Valley with his guide, Kootenay Brown. The previous cabin photos are courtesy of the Glenbow in Calgary. This classic photo showing Kootenay second from the left is courtesy of the Galt Museum and Archive in Lethbridge. The location is exactly where today's picnic area, Haybarn is, along the Waterton River. The photo was published with an article in the Detroit Free Press in 1899, entitled Kootenay Smith, a hospitable character of the Rocky Mountains. Why called Smith and not Brown? A bit odd. The photographer was Fred L. Russell, an early newspaper reporter in southern Alberta. And according to the original homestead records, this cabin, built in 1882, was Kootenay's first homestead. And this well-known photograph is courtesy of the Glenbow, Kootenay and Isabella's 1913-1916 home at headquarters, today's lower compound, just below what is today the Resource Conservation Office. Originally, it was Waterton's first motel. Note the two doors. Kootenay bought it from the Jensen brothers and moved it from across the road. Living here shortly after his appointment in 1910 as forest ranger in charge, he was closer to the action than he had been at Poplar Grove. So there briefly, you have it, his other homes in Waterton, and from those cabins, nothing remains but the pictures. Here in this slide, you see the cabin he and Isabella lived in from 1906 and 1913 at Poplar Grove. Today, this cabin still stands. Proudly displayed in the Pincher Creek Folk Museum, Kootenay Brown Pioneer Village, moved in 1970 by the local historical society. It was the society's first acquisition. You see the cabin in situ, top left, abandoned for half a century. The two photos on the right are of the 1970 move, and bottom left as it sits today in the museum, 50 kilometers to the north in Pincher Creek. It is still a popular attraction among the many, many features of built heritage in that museum today. And it was the marking of the centennial of Kootenay's passing that got me looking for the original location of the cabin. Having been moved half a century ago, it became obvious no one in my circle knew exactly where it originally sat. An old rancher on the Waterton River got me looking in the right direction. And here in this slide, you see us celebrating the centennial day, Kootenay's passing 100 years later in 2016, interpreting the life and times of Kootenay. And the local historians pictured Farley Wuth, Gordon Tolton, and Chris Morrison. Continuing my search for Poplar Grove for the cabin location, using this 1939 air photo from the park's archive, I was able to see with the stereoscope, the lonely cabin standing in the meadow. That meadow circled. I could pick out as well the old trail in the photo. The old trail connecting Kootenay's door with what would have been Waterton Mills Post Office at today's Maskinonge picnic area. So much of the early correspondence pertaining to the management of the Forest Reserve and later the Dominion Park would have been carried along that trail by Kootenay. My search on that evening, July 14, 2016, two days before the centennial of his passing, it proved fruitful. I was quite in awe of the surroundings at the old cabin site and thought immediately seeing the aspen trees that there could be scribings from the old days. And sure enough, within minutes, a living Joe Cosley tree, indeed, Cosley's trademark heart 
surrounded by his stylized JC initial. And above the heart, 29, 1929. That summer evening in the grove, I located seven or so trees with initials and dates. This one alone left no guesses as to who had visited Poplar Grove. Joe Cosley and his numerous known trees, several of them in museum collections today, including the one depicted here on the right. It stood along the snowshoe trail above Red Rock until the great snowstorm of June 2002 toppled it. And until July 14, 2016, it was the last known living Cosley tree. Still legible in the old bark, you can see Joe Cosley, November 09, 1897. Note, and also on the left in this sketch by the Twin Butte author and, and historian, the late Don Bressler, on the trunk of the tree, the heart, and the date 1913. We don't have time to go into Joe's history in detail, but suffice it to say, he was well known in the area, a local character indeed in Waterton Glacier. And like Kootenay Brown, much has been written about him. And interestingly, much was written by him. He was published widely across the continent. And a bit of a local legend, trapper, trail builder, artist, park ranger, World War I veteran, and something too I understand regards trapping beaver in the Belly River within the boundary of the park. And a good account of the man can be found in the book, Belly River's famous Joe Cosley by Brian McClung. Joe, a survivor of the residential school system Shingwalk, spent at least three years there, 1877 to 1880. Algoma University professor Ed Sadowski, working with a descendant of the Stephen and Mary Okita Cosley family of Mississauga First Nation territory, have put together Joe's story and the story of many others in this history of the residential school. I encourage anyone interested to look up Shingwalk Residential Schools Center in Wikipedia to understand the very good work being done through the efforts of many in understanding the truth. And on July 9th, 2021, a CBC News release stated, Parks Canada has designated the former Chingwalk Residential School in Sault Ste. Marie as a National Historic Site. The designation shows that Canada is committed to telling stories about the shameful and racist colonial policy that led to these institutions. Chingwalk School picture and a snip from the original register. The two young brothers noting too their indigenous names, sun-like face and cloud appearing. Indeed, for one of the scribe trees, so much is understood. But there is much to learn about initials and dates on the other trees. Pictured is former Waterton Park Warden, cultural resource manager Rob Watt, assisting me with aging trees in the grove. And if this slideshow inspires any of you to visit the site, understand that no maintained trail exists from Chief Mountaineer National Highway through from Waterton. And it is just outside Waterton's east boundary on a Nature Conservancy easement and is leased by a local rancher for cattle grazing. It's imperative that one follows the Nature Conservancy Canada website guidance prior to considering visiting. It will provide you contact information to request access from the folks on the Bird's Eye Ranch. So a better way to visit the site as Peter will explain, I'm certain here, um, he will speak about his preservation work, recording the site in 3D. And he's pictured here, standing lookers right of the Cosley tree, 
in the brown shirt. With others who support our efforts in trying to understand and recognize this site, people from Nature Conservancy, Biosphere Reserve Association, Province of Alberta and Parks Canada. And we'll turn it over now to Peter and I will stop sharing and take it away. Thanks Edwin, I'll just uh, call up my presentation here. Is everybody seeing this okay? You bet. Okay, good. Well, thanks very much. And it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, talking with you today about this really fascinating project that we did with, uh, with Edwin, digitally preserving what we call culturally modified trees or CMTs in archaeology at Kootenay Brown's homestead. And I thought what I would do today is kind of just sort of give you a an overview of um, of a few things to talk about to, to put the, the project into a context. So I'll talk a little bit about sort of who I am and what digital heritage is. It might be a term that's uh, fairly new to some of you. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about the differences between human-made heritage and what we call biological heritage, which is becoming kind of an interesting area of heritage preservation and recognition right now. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the, how we actually sort of set about to digitally capture and preserve in 3D a, a forest with these really interesting cultural modifi uh, culturally modified trees. And, um, and then talk a little bit about uh, the archive itself where you can actually find information about this project as well as the history that, uh, that Edwin sort of gave a, a nice overview of. So I'll just sort of start by kind of introducing myself, I guess. I had a nice introduction in the beginning, but um, I'm a, a professor of archaeology and what's called a digital archaeologist, which uh, is sort of a new kind of 21st century version of a traditional archaeologist. And um, what I do basically is I use things like terrestrial LIDAR. Uh, these are kind of technologies that are used in geomatics engineering to digitally preserve heritage sites that are at risk of destruction due to the impacts of climate change and human caused destruction. And I basically operate uh, several archives and the one I wanna kind of draw your attention to because it's currently the home of the Kootenay Brown Poplar Site Project is the Alberta Digital Heritage Archive. And you can see the Earl there where you can basically go and visit uh, the, the site after the talk and see firsthand, uh, take a look at the work that we've been doing. And um, we've got over a dozen sites in the archive. The mission statement of the archive essentially is to focus primarily on heritage sites that are at risk that don't have any kind of official site designation. Um, so there are a few sites like, for example, the Brooks Aqueduct and the Okotoks Erratic Big Rock, which actually do have provincial and in some cases national heritage designations. But the majority of the heritage sites that we digitally capture in this archive are don't have those official designations they're not officially recognized but they are of extreme importance to particular communities and groups of individuals who have a very sort of close association with them now most of the built most of the sites that we have in the archive that we've digitally preserved are what we call human made heritage so buildings and bridges and aqueducts and so on but there are uh, there is one particular site now too that kind of fall into this category of biological heritage sites and you know, we often, when we think about heritage sites, human-made heritage sites, we often sort of imagine that they're basically kind of permanent, you know, that a heritage building will kind of remain standing for another 50 years if it's been standing for previously for 150 years. Um, but of course, heritage sites are at risk due to a variety of different factors. And the same is also true for biological heritage sites. And what I mean by biological heritage sites are sites like, for example, trees. So what you can see there on the left-hand side of your screen is our project page for the Stampede Elm. And some of you may know that the Stampede Elm is a 140-year-old elm tree that sits currently in the middle of Victoria Park in a parking lot. Um, back when it was a, a seedling and a younger tree, it actually was in the confluence of several backyards in a much younger version of Calgary. And the Stampede Elm basically has sat there, as I say, for 140 years, 120 years, I should say, um, and it's seen a lot, but it's currently at risk of destruction because of the potential construction of the, the Calgary Flames new arena. So I was asked by the city of Calgary to digitally preserve the tree because there were attempts that were being made at the time to move the tree to another location. And it was around that time that I was reading a book called The Overstory by Richard Powers. 
And the book is a really fascinating book. I definitely encourage you to read it. It's a fictional account of five people's associations with uh, with trees. And um, they actually all sort of come together in the book to preserve a stand of ancient redwoods that's basically at risk of being destroyed. And as I was reading this book and getting ready to digitally preserve the Stampede Elm, I was working with Judy uh, Guimont, who is a biologist with the city of Calgary. And you can see her in that still image of a YouTube video in the project below. And I was fascinated by the relationship that she had with this tree. I mean, she, she basically, this tree to her meant something. It was a significant heritage object. It had seen you know, thing, a, the, a city like Calgary change a huge amount over a period of 120 years. And she was really sort of upset that the, uh, she understood the reasons behind it, but of course she was really upset that the tree would have to be either potentially cut down or moved to a, a new location. So this was basically what we ended up coming up with. What you're looking at here is what's called a point cloud. So this animation is of the Stampede Elm, and what you're looking at are millions upon millions of points of laser light that map out in very exact detail every branch, every uh, every sort of leaf, every piece of bark. Uh, it's an extremely accurate model of this tree. So if and when the tree is lost, and it seems likely that it will, we have a digital record of this tree. And an arborist, for example, could measure the length of branches, could measure the size of the canopy, and so on and so forth. But as a heritage object, I think this is a really fascinating kind of way to ensure that the Stampede Elm and the stories associated with it live on for future generations. So it was with this sort of idea that we kind of approached the digital preservation of the Cosley Grove. And just to kind of come back to this idea of heritage at risk, which is really kind of what's behind uh, a lot of my heritage work. You know, we're interested in digitally capturing sites that are at risk. Biological heritage sites, like human-made heritage sites, are at risk due to a variety of different uh, factors, some human-caused, um, some, uh, you know, uh, environmental. And I think, um, you know, the Kino wildfire uh, back uh, four years ago or so really kind of, you know, brought to the forefront um, an awareness that biological as well as human heritage sites are at risk due to wildfire, which has become a, a great threat. And in fact, if you go into the Digital Heritage Archive, the Alberta Digital Heritage Archive, you'll see what remains of the Waterton Lakes uh, Visitor Center, which we scanned with Bill Perry to capture the, the remaining mason work after the building itself had burned down. Wind is another issue. Um, you know, that area of uh, Alberta, sort of uh, southwestern Alberta, is known for its high winds. And uh, of course, winds can topple trees. Anybody that lives in a forest, as I do, I live out in Bragg Creek, can tell you that when the wind blows a gale, you often worry about trees coming down on your buildings and uh, maybe even on yourself. Uh, vandalism is another potential uh, impact uh, to biological heritage. Trees can be cut down, they can be defaced. Um, and of course, wild animals. Uh, there was actually evidence of bear scratchings on a lot of the trees when we were out scanning the, the grove. So in order to understand how you digitally preserve a forest, you kind of need to know something about what a terrestrial laser scanner is. And um, it's really kind of like a 3D camera. And what happens is that the instrument basically emits millions of points of laser light in 360 degrees. And what the instrument does is it measures the amount of time taken for each of those millions of points of laser light to leave the scanner strike a surface like the wall of a building or a roof or the ground or in this case uh, you know uh, the trunk of a tree or the branch of a tree and then return to the scanner and it does this millions and millions of times creating a very dense cloud of points that accurately outline um, the surface that the laser light itself strikes and there's two kinds of terrestrial laser scanners uh, the one that we tend to use a lot is a stationary scanner it's kind of like a 3d camera and it sits on a tripod and like a camera, the, the digital, the um, uh, laser scanner can only capture what it can see. So you have to move the scanner around and through a building in order to capture the building from all of its sides. And then you kind of stitch all of those different uh, scans together to create a single 3D image. But in the case of something like uh, a forest, um, the idea of setting up a scanner you know, multiple times to capture a forest with a fairly dense stand of trees just really wasn't something that would really kind of be practical. So we utilized a different type of a scanner, a mobile scanner. This is a GeoSlam mobile scanner. And what this allows you to do is walk around and basically sort of scan as you walk. 
And using very complex SLAM algorithms, what happens is that the scans are georeferenced uh, using GPS, and then they're automatically stitched together as you move around, creating this sort of 3D model on the fly as you're kind of walking around and through the, the forest. And one of the advantages of uh, the GeoSlam mobile scanner over a terrestrial laser scanner is that you can scan large areas very, very quickly. Um, and usually uh, you have about 20 minutes with this particular scanner before you have to then return to where you started and then begin a new scan if you need to. So I was lucky enough to go out with Edwin to the site in advance of the project. And uh, we went out and looked at the, these culturally modified trees and uh, the day we were out to do the scan, we thought probably the best way to approach this would be to attach a target to each of the culturally modified trees that were identified by Edwin and his group so that we could reference photographs of each of the, of the, um, of the carvings to uh, the point cloud. So we could basically kind of, you know, sort of see the digital version of the tree and then attach or, or, or append a photograph of that particular uh, carving to that digital tree. Um, we also had to plan a route for the GeoSlam laser scanner. And, and basically what happens is, is you kind of walk around uh, the site. You've got 20 minutes, so you set a timer to walk. And um, basically the only provision is, is that you have to basically have a closed loop. So that means that you have to begin and end at the same point uh, in space. So there's a certain amount of planning. You also want to make sure you're not walking over trees that have kind of collapsed in case you trip and fall, because of course you don't want to damage the scanner. And then once the data is collected, uh, we then analyze it and archive it and then create a page. We create 3D models and uh, and so on for um, uh, for installation in our public archive, which you can uh, you can see, which sort of is basically a knowledge mobilization tool. It kind of raises awareness of the history of this particular stand of trees, the importance of culturally modified trees and biological heritage. So what you're looking at here is the point cloud that I collected uh, of the Cosley Grove. And you can see that the area that I collected data on is quite large. So you're looking at a, a cloud of millions upon millions upon millions of points of laser light. And this is the uncolored version of the cloud. And the cloud itself is colored according to the height of the object being scanned. So blue is ground level all the way up to the lighter shade of blue towards green, which indicates the highest point of the treetops. And I'll come to that in a minute, one of the kind of advantages of this particular type of approach to digital preservation is that it provides some interesting data that forestry people uh, can, can utilize. But those red lines represent the path that I walked in order to capture the grove itself. So the area I captured is about uh, roughly the size of two football fields, and I captured all that information in about 20 minutes. And that was just me walking with the scanner by myself. And we have a sub centimeter level of accuracy, so we can actually calculate quite um, precisely and accurately things like the height of trees and uh, and 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 the, the extent of the area captured and so on. Now, on top of the camera itself, or on top of the scanner itself, is a panoramic camera which captures color information and then maps that color information onto the point cloud. So what you're looking at at the top of this slide here is the uh, kind of resulting photorealistic model of the Cosley Grove, which is colored more or less to the way it appeared the day we scanned it. And as I was saying, the, the model itself can be used for a variety of purposes. One of the things it can be used for is visualizing biological heritage. So as Edwin said, you know, this particular site is a little bit challenging to get to. We probably don't want too many people visiting the site because of the potential for damage to the site. So people can visit the grove virtually through the archive that I was just mentioning. But as I also want to kind of mention as well, there's some really interesting applications for forestry uh, with this data, which I'll get into in a minute. So what you're looking at here is uh, the point cloud, and we're just going to do a, a little bit of an animated fly through just to kind of give you a kind of a feel. This is a kind of a, a low resolution uh, version of the point cloud, but you can see that we've managed to capture um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of significant part of the grove where most of the culturally modified trees, if not all of them, are located. And, uh, you know, it kind of gives you a sense uh, of sort of what it's like to be kind of in the grove, the spacing of the trees relative to one another, uh, and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, we can create all sorts of these kind of animated flybys to kind of highlight different areas of the grove, depending upon what kind of information we want to communicate. 
So as I mentioned, uh, we wanted to make sure that we could map or tag the point cloud, the trees in the point cloud to their associated um, uh, their associated carvings. So each of the culturally modified trees that had a carving was a, ta uh, a target was attached to it. And then we took photographs, digital photographs of the um, of the uh, the carvings with the reference targets. And this allowed us to tag each of the trees in the point cloud with its corresponding carving. So when you go into the archive on the top image there, you can see it. I'm not sure how clear this is, but um, each of the trees that has a culturally modified like a carving on it has a, a number from one till I think it's something like 12. And when you click on the, the little label, it calls up a, um, a, a photograph of the carving. So you can see what carving is associated with what tree. And you can basically kind of work your way through the virtual Cosley Grove, clicking on these labels, calling up the appropriate, um, the appropriate photographs, illustrating the different carvings. And then when you go into the archive itself uh, and click on the Kootenai Brown Poplar Grove cabin site, you'll see uh, an interactive uh, model of the grove. So when you click on that triangle there, it loads a three-dimensional model of the point cloud, which you can rotate, zoom in, zoom out of, and basically kind of get a sense of what the, the grove is actually like. And you can see basically that um, we have some basic locational information. Uh, that's not the exact latitude and longitude for the location of the grove. It's sort of a more general lat and longitude, but we also have a threat meter or a threat level for all of our heritage sites, which kind of gives people a visual cue as to, you know, how threatened this particular site is. When you when you scroll further down the project page for the uh, for this particular for uh, for the Cosley Grove, you'll get uh, background information, which provides a lot of the information about Kootenai Brown that um, that uh, uh, Edwin was um, was discussing earlier on in his presentation, as well as historic photographs that you can access in the photo gallery section. So you can actually see high resolution images of the carvings themselves, as well as historic images of Kootenai Brown and uh, other uh, sort of relevant images of the point cloud and, and so on and so forth. But perhaps most importantly, at the back end of the archive, the 3D scanning information is archived and tagged with metadata. So basically for perpetuity now, the digital record of the Cosley, of the Cosley Grove is stored on servers at the University of Calgary. So the, if any trees were in fact lost, um, we'll have a record basically of the stand as it was digitally documented, as it appeared when we scanned it just this past, uh, this past May. So this is basically, I think one of the true benefits is that we're archiving these digital data sets so that if the sites themselves are ever lost, some record of them will actually be maintained. So just like a historic photograph or an archival document, these 3D laser scans are archived um, so that they can remain accessible to future generations. Now, the other thing that I think is useful from this kind of data set is that you can actually use information from the point clouds that is of interest to people in forestry, for example. And in fact, in Europe, a lot of foresters are using mobile laser scanners to capture information about the forest. So in this particular instance here, I've color coded the point cloud according to height. And on that scale, which you may or may not be able to see the actual details of, there's actually, you know, numeric uh, sort of numbers. So I can actually measure how high any one of those particular trees is. And as you kind of move from green all the way up through to the top of the, um, the canopy, you can see we get upwards of uh, over 9.3 meters in height. And you can measure things like canopy width and, and so on and so forth. So one of the things we want to do is actually return to the grove and rescan it uh, maybe every, every few years and combine the scanning data together to see if we can identify any changes that have taken place in the grove, such as uh, fallen trees, um, you know, that kind of thing. So it's actually a really useful monitoring tool for kind of keeping track of what kinds of impacts are happening to the Cosley Grove. We'll be able to identify what trees may have fallen in the interim period between when we scanned it in May and if we scan it again this spring. Uh, it might give us an idea about how at risk these particular trees are. So that kind of dovetails into what I what I was going to talk about here just really quickly. Um, I've kind of gone over this already, but change detection is what I was just sort of describing. And I think it would be really useful to go back and and uh, scan the Cosley Grove, say, every every year and compare that scan data to get an idea about, you know, 
what's happening in that grove in terms of trees falling due to wind or or, or that kind of thing. Um, and we actually, to, to that end, we, we want to donate the data that we've collected and that we may collect in the future to the Nature Conservancy of Canada for use uh, in forestry uh, and, and in whatever way they, they might want to use it. So there's benefits beyond simply digitally documenting heritage. We think there's also some interesting benefits for, you know, again, uh, for, for people in, in the forestry community. So that's it. So I'd like to thank uh, Edwin for introducing me to a really fascinating uh, area of Alberta and a fascinating history. And uh, we've had a lot of people involved in this project from the industry side, like Matt Tepler from GeoSlam, as well as from the Parks Canada side, like Bill and Edwin, and uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada side through uh, Lindsay Davidson. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions from you, as I'm sure Edwin, Edwin would as well. Uh, thank you, Peter and Edwin, for a wonderful presentation. Um, so now is the time uh, to type any questions you have into the chat. Um, you can also use the reactions menu to raise your hand if you'd like to be called on to ask your question. Thanks, Samara. Thanks, Peter. Any questions? And if anyone would like any more information, feel free to reach out. My Gmail address, edwin.knox. All right, looks like we have a question from Jeff here. Uh, Jeff, you are welcome to go ahead and unmute your mic. Jeff Doherty. Not working for us, maybe Samara. No, it doesn't appear so. Jeff, if you wouldn't mind typing your question in the chat. In the meantime, we will go to a question by Nadia. Uh, she wrote, this is so fascinating. Thank you. I never knew LIDAR could be captured in the ground, even for cultural resource monitoring. So cool. So a little bit less of a question, uh, but excellent feedback. Great. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think that there's actually an international organization called SciArc, which is based in California. And James Cameron, who we all know from uh, Titanic and Avatar, he kind of was, you know, really interested in 3D technology back in 2010 when Avatar came out. And he became a patron of SciArc. And, uh, he actually has his Titanic data stored in their online archive. So it's becoming a, a really sort of a, a, a more common way, I guess, of, uh, of preserving heritage sites. Um, I think it's just interesting that, you know, a lot of times these, these, the heritage archive work that's done focuses on these really large, grand, well-known sites like Pompeii and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chichen Itza and so on and uh, quite often these smaller heritage sites which are really significant to local communities are often not sort of uh, you know they're disregarded or they're kind of looked over so I think that these technologies have some definite applicability to um, making sure that these sites aren't lost because I think they're very important. I was impressed Peter how the um, Blackfoot Crossing a display there was so well captured through your archive and is now displayed at your archive and you can tour basically the the museum as it was when that display was in place. Yeah, that was the uh, that was actually the Blackfoot gallery at the Glenbow and of course the Glenbow is undergoing some major renovations and uh, I don't know many of you may or may not remember if you've been to the Blackfoot to the, the Blackfoot gallery at Glenbow it was actually designed and and created by Blackfoot elders who worked 20 some odd years ago to create it. So the community was quite upset when they found out that the, the, the gallery would be taken, taken down while the renovations happened because they take their children there. There's a lot of cultural awareness training that goes on there. So we digitally captured the gallery before it was dismantled and put it in our archives so that it could continue to be used by knowledge keepers um, to, you know, so, and there would be some record of it as well. Uh, because it really is a significant, I think, um, development in museology having Blackfoot, uh, you know, uh, knowledge keepers involved in the design of um, 
of, uh, of of galleries that kind of present their history to the public. It was very forward thinking at its you know for its time. I think twenty some odd years ago. Yes. It it looks like we have uh, Jeff's mic working now. Jeff, would you like to take an opportunity to ask your question? Yes, for sure. Um, I was looking at some of those some of the images, uh, Edwin. Who are some of those other initials? Like there was what PP uh, was one of the initials. I'm just curious if you have any. If you've been well, able to figure out who those people are. I mean. What we've been doing with those initially, I was thinking uh, because it was <clears throat> NWP, uh, immediately I'm thinking, OK, uh, given um, the location of the trading post in the 18 late 1870s, that it could be Northwest Police NWP. I looked through the Fort McLeod Museum and the list of members who were present at Fort McLeod through those years. And I've been, um, didn't get didn't get any positive hits exactly, but there were, there was a name in there, Zeke, Z-E-K-E, -E, and one other, um, Fred Pope, who they may have been associated with Kootenai Brown when he was with the Northwest Police during the Louis Rebellion, working as a guide. And there's also, so there's that one connection potentially, and there's more research to be done there and very little of it has been recently. But the other thing is too, that the Great Waldron Ranch, when cattle were brought into the country in 1883, um, one winter there was over a thousand head of cattle that were kept in the Waterton Valley area and <clears throat> may have been folks associated in that, given that we see 83, scribed in a couple of trees. It could be a couple of old cowmen who were were um, keeping an eye on the cattle in those winters. And um, yeah, so there's there's lots more to be done. And if anyone who's listening has any interesting ideas or is interested to help with such a thing, we'd be sure interested to reach reach them. Nothing definite, Jeff, other than JC Joe Cosley. Okay, thank you for that, Edwin. Last call for questions. I'll just make a comment if I could, and it comes back to Joe Cosley's time at Chinwak uh, Residential School. And another project we're working on right now is digitally preserving surviving Indian residential schools in Alberta. And of course, uh, tomorrow's Orange Shirt Day, but today at the University of Calgary, we're we're honoring the memory of um, of the missing children by by um, you know uh, wearing orange shirts today. So uh, I think it's an interesting link between the work that uh, we were doing. I never, exp I actually didn't know that that Joe Cosley actually attended yes. a residential school. So it's quite amazing how these projects kind of sometimes link together in ways yes. that you don't expect. Yes. The work that Ed Sadowski is doing through Algoma University and Shinwalk Residential School building is actually a, a sort of a part of the campus in a sense. And um, and it was fascinating for us to gain that understanding first about 10 or 15 years ago, but um, much more information has surfaced more recently. And, and he is, Ed is working with a direct descendant of the Cosley family and they're putting together more and more. So it's all a very interesting link and it's uh, definitely another chapter for Brian McClung's book, Belly River's Famous Joe Cosley, because of course in it, not, none of that is mentioned, but there are so many interesting aspects of Cosley's adult life that one can um, think about in relationship to his early upbringing. Oh, we do actually have another question. Uh, so this is from uh, Kristen. Uh, when a tree falls down, is there any way the fallen tree can be preserved? I'll just mention from previous experience with other Cosley trees that um, in the Peter and Catherine White, the White Museum in Banff, there's an excellent tree that was on Andy Russell's, the great wildlife author, on Andy's property in Pine Ridge, just uh, north of Waterton, Highway 6. When the tree was living, Andy cut it down and he cut out the part with the very, uh, very legible scribing and he pulled away all of the inner 
part of the tree. So he left about a th four inch thick portion of the bark surrounding the scribing. And he dried it thoroughly and pr presented it to Catherine White as a gift in Banff. And it's in the archive in Banff. It's uh, pristine. It's very well done. The, the, the old tree at the Goat Lake Junction fell in the great snowstorm of 2002 in June. We went in there within weeks and we took out the piece. It was not properly preserved in the sense that ants were still residents and it, it got just worse and worse over the years. But there are techniques if you get there early on to sort of stop um, by one method or another to uh, to stop the deterioration. But um, it it uh, and it with the Cosley trees that are in museums, I must say they're doing quite well. And uh, Belly River Ranger Station has one. There's two in the Cardston Museum, and um, one in the Park Archive in Waterton. That's uh, that's the old one from the Goat Lake Junction, not doing so well. Anything to add, Peter? No, that's uh, that's really interesting. All right, wonderful. I think it's about time to wrap up. Um, so we want to thank everyone today for joining us for all the wonderful questions. Um, thank you so much to Edwin, Peter, and of course our planning and tech teams throughout the entire week. Be sure to watch for announcements regarding next year's Waterton Glacier Science and History Week. We'd love for your feedback about the webinar's audio and video quality. Um, you can let us know your comments or additional questions by emailing crownrlc at nps.gov. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks.